I would like to introduce to you, with great pleasure, our first speaker, um, Mariama, Reverend Mariama White Hammond, who is a minister for ecological justice at the Bethel AME Church in Boston, in JP, and is a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition. She's been uh, an inspiration to many people and has her hands in so many extraordinary, wonderful pies, I can't even begin to tell you about it, so I will let her do the telling. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so we'll practice that. So my tradition, we call and respond. So if I say good evening, it's a, an invitation for you to, to respond. So good evening. Good evening. Much better. Thank you. Um, so I, I was uh, thinking about what I wanted to say tonight. And I've, you know, I've spoken a few places. And I have a few lectures and a few thoughts. Um, but tonight I thought um, that there's a pretty high probability that if you are here, then you are among the people who, that, who believe that climate change is real and it is a crisis that we must address. Um, in fact, I would guess that some of you are like me and you can't even understand all those people who seem to just keep living their lives and are not haunted by the specter of our climate future. You know, all those people who continue to live as though we are not facing a crisis of cataclysmic proportions. So this crowd is the converted. Um, and given that, there's probably very few facts that I could share with you um, that would not be known by a good proportion of the room. And so I, I thought tonight I wanted to share a little of my own journey um, of how I've come to do this work and why I do this work um, and hope that it will begin to set the stage for um, the many conversations that you will be having over this weekend um, and, uh, and, and the different workshops. So, so I grew up in a family that recycled. And I went to a school that had an environmental club in the early 90s. And I remember I even gave up aerosol hairspray uh, in the 90s in order to protect the ozone layer, which any of you that were around and who were in high school in the early 90s know that giving up aerosol hairspray was actually a pretty big deal. Um, so compared to most people, um, in my community, I would have been considered almost an environmentalist. <laughs> but the truth is that I could never really fully dedicate myself to environmental concerns, because at the same time that the ozone layer was depleting, in the early 90s, my neighborhood, I grew up in, in Roxbury, was facing a gang conflict and the war on drugs, which was leading many young people in our neighborhood to either die or to be locked up by um, the policies in the United States that have led us to be the most incarcerated country in the world. And so while the girls at my elite private school were worried about the danger of ultraviolet rays, I was also concerned about the bullet that nearly killed my cousin. I lived between a world where people fretted about future disasters and a world where some people just tried to make it through the day. And so when I was asked to get more involved in the environmental work, I decided that I just didn't have time and that I would just leave those issues to more, more privileged suburbanites from my school. In fact, you know, they weren't working on these other issues. They could handle the environment. So in college, I learned more about environmental justice. I tutored in a school um, that would be considered environmental justice community. Um, where there were large issues with pollution in the ground, in the air. Um, and the, some of the young people I tutored were living near a site where they were proposing another cement plant <laughs> after that community had already borne the brunt of so many dangerous toxic chemicals. And so I got a little bit more involved. I learned about environmental justice. Uh, but ultimately, I figured that there were other more pressing issues like why my kids needed to be tutored in a specialized program because they went to schools that didn't give them the resources that they should have had in the first place. So like many people in college, I understood that climate change was real and it was serious. But my feeling was, 
so was police brutality or the lack of health care that was killing people right then and there. My perspective changed in the summer of 2005. At the time, I was running a youth project called Project Hip Hop. Um, it was working with high school age young people. And every summer, we would do a trip um, either to the south or through the, through the north, studying the history of um, the civil rights movement, or in this case, in this summer, um, the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party, really looking at people who saw challenges in their community and tried to step up and do something about it. That summer, I, like every year, we would do interviews of young people. They'd come in and we'd choose, you know, the 12 or 14 young people that we felt were the strongest for the summer. And we'd completed our interviews, um, and I got a call from someone who worked at uh, the Department of Youth Services, which is the euphemistic name that they give to our juvenile detention system. Um, and she said, I want to bring this young person in. And I said, OK, well, you know, we're done. <laughs> so I just, I don't know if we can fit him in. She's like, no, 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 I think he's perfect for the program. I said, if you can get him here today, we'll consider it. She brought in this young man, Kareem Burry, who, I mean, when I say perfect fit, he loved hip hop music and culture. He knew something about its history. Most young people only knew the rappers they heard on the radio right then. He knew something about the history of hip hop and where it came from. And he could not have come to interview earlier because he had only gotten out of detention about two days before he showed up at Project Hip Hop. I was thankful that he had come and I was pretty sure that this young person was going to be a leader in our organization. And so he came and we did the early training and we had a retreat where they went away and of course they didn't listen to me when I told them, please go to bed, we have workshops in the morning, or it never works out for you to have relationships with each other. It always leads to drama down the line. These are the things you tell teenagers that they, didn't, they won't listen to, which I can't be upset because I didn't listen when I was their own age doing the same program. <laughs> but it was clear that Kareem was a leader. Um, when he asked people to sort of pull it together, they listened. And his reflections, particularly on his grandmother's migration story of coming to the United States from Jamaica, really set the tone for the way that young people could make connections between their own history and their own lives and the work we were trying to do in our communities. So we got home from our retreat, and I reminded them that they, we would need to come in on Wednesday. That was our next training day, and it was my birthday, so they needed to not be late because I wasn't staying late. And that morning, I woke up as my husband said, happy birthday. I got a call that Kareem at 2 o'clock in the morning had been stabbed and died about a mile from my house. Obviously, that was tough for me, and it was tough for the young people. And at the same time, it sort of gave this kind of deep connection and a deep sense of purpose for that summer. We wanted to dedicate that summer to him to really honor his memory. And the reality that maybe if our world had been different, we would have realized all of the amazing gifts he had to offer instead of his life being taken so young. And so by the end of the summer, I said to all my staff, we've had a long summer, go home. We're going to just shut down for a week. And they, uh, you know, everybody obliged. And I went home. And that was the week that we began to hear that Hurricane Katrina was going to hit the Gulf Coast. New Orleans was a community that, with which Project Hip Hop had strong relationships because they also had a lot of youth arts programs. And so as we watched on television, the natural disaster of the storm and then the unnatural disaster of our response to those who were stuck in New Orleans. At the end of that summer, I decided I needed to go to the Gulf Coast and spend two weeks there. And I realized that my perspective of letting somebody else handle the environmental crisis while I worked on all the other pressing issues was misguided. Because I saw the same young people that I was trying to work with and save in my communities being affected by an environmental disaster that poor people, people without a car, people without extra money to get out couldn't survive. And so at that point, I started to shift my own thinking. 
But then I went back to my life, was a little bit better, recycled a little bit more, added a little bit of environmental work into our own, until I hit the summer of 2008. Over a 10 month period in 2008 into 2009, I had 10 young people shot, two of whom died. And during that time, randomly kind of on a whim, I had first at the beginning bought this orchid. And I remember every morning I would wake up so excited. As for those of you who love orchids, you know that they, they mostly do their blooming at night. So you fall asleep and you wake up in the morning and they've opened. And I would get so excited about this orchid. And my husband was like, yeah, flowers bloom. That's kind of like what they do. <laughs> but I realized, not then, only about a year later, when I got deeper and deeper into gardening, that really those plants were helping me work through the reality that death was surrounding me, unnatural death, death that shouldn't have been. And being able to see those plants continue to survive reminded me of how things should be, even when all around me they were not as that, in that way. And so I continued to work, do the things, and again, get more involved and environmental concerns. But in the summer of 2013, I decided, I also have to be admit, I admit I was also tired of fundraising. Any of you who've ever run a nonprofit, you know that the, the work of raising the money does get to you eventually. And I decided that I was called to do more than just work in the neighborhood that I was in. And I loved my young people and I loved the work that I did. Um, it changed me and transformed me, but I knew it was time to move in a different direction. And so that summer of 2013, I told my board and all my young people that that would be my last summer, that in the fall I would be, um, or in the fall of 2014, I would start seminary and I started putting out my applications and doing all that work. Does anybody remember the summer of 2013 and the major event that happened that summer? There was a pretty big thing that I would say kicked off the Black Lives Matter movement. The summer of 2013, Again, we had young people. We were training them. We set up our training months in advance. And on Thursday, I remember, the training was about Emmett Till. We talked about his life, about his death, and how his death was such an important catalyst to the civil rights movement. Not just his death, but his mother's decision to make the whole world see what had happened to her 14-year-old son. We'd studied that lesson, and the next day, the Zimmerman verdict came down in which he was acquitted for killing Trayvon Martin. Our young people set about creating a artistic piece called Stand Your Ground, in which a young man came out holding an Arizona bottle and a box of Skittles and was killed. And one young person that summer, John Caesar, after we had tried to make this project work, and there was this one scene that wasn't working, and they decided to change it. And after the death of, of Trayvon Martin, who is laid to rest and then becomes Emmett Till, there's a speech from Dr. King, a letter from a Birmingham jail. And John was one of our young people who came to Project Hip Hop partially because he had gotten into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> but he was given the speech and told, you know, you have a few days to memorize it. He said, no, I'll memorize it overnight. And he did. In fact, I think it's because I told him, no, I'm not sure you can do it all in one night. I think he did not sleep until he memorized that whole poem. But he came back the next day and spoke so powerfully the words of Dr. King in which he said, we cannot wait, and challenged all those people who said that we should change racial justice slowly and moderately. That was my last summer. It was a great one, and I began my transition out, ready to go to seminary, which for me was like a break comparatively. I had planned to go study and think about environmental issues, look at the connection between spirituality, 
and nature. And I kicked off my time there with a lot more gardening, a lot more time for reflection, and a time to think about where I was called to go next. And during that time, I welcomed my youngest goddaughter into the world, who was John's daughter. Her name is Soraya. And our biggest pastime was all during her, well, until she got to be a really strong walker. But for about 18 months, we spent a lot of time with plants in my house, in the garden. And then I got almost to the end of my seminary career. I was in my last semester looking forward to uh, moving on in the next part of my life. John was working at Dunkin' Donuts. Not a great salary, but something that kept a roof over their heads. And I was on my way to a meeting about a climate simulation, which would bring together people from suburbs and the city to talk about how we would be affected um, by a cataclysmic storm and to look at the connections of issues of race and class and that. That morning as I headed to the meeting, I had the agenda, it was printed out, I was ready to go, and I got a call that John um, had been shot in the head, so he probably was not going to survive. I dropped off the photocopies, went straight to the hospital, and I had been, at this point, relatively newly ordained. As you can imagine, he did not make it. And instead of going to my college reunion as I was supposed to, I stayed with his family as they made the decision to take him off of life support. And then a couple days later, I headed to Baltimore for a big environmental conference, unable to stop thinking about what had happened. I returned to Boston and performed my first funeral for a young man who I had come to love deeply. And then with only four days, I was on a plane headed to Standing Rock, North Dakota to protest the pipeline there. While I was there, I saw so many young people, young men like John, many of them unemployed. Because if, for those of you who don't know, there's really unfortunately high, high levels of unemployment in so many Native communities and on so many reservations for so many reasons. But I saw young men, so many like him, finally standing up and finding a cause where they felt like they belonged, where they felt like they had something to live for, and even something to die for. And as I stood on the hill that they actually call Facebook Hill, it's one of the only places that you can get a decent cell phone reception <laughs> in the reservation, and I looked out, I recognized that so many of our Native brothers and sisters we're calling us to that which I think we must do in this moment. We must realize that the earth has amazing gifts to offer. We don't need to fix the planet. We need to fix ourselves. We have lost the sense of wonder and beauty for the gift that has been given to us of this planet. We've lost a sense of respect for life, even of our own species. So for me, the problem is not parts per million in the atmosphere. Those are simply a measure of how far off we have gone. The real problem is that we are wasting so many of the precious resources that we have. The human resources, the water resources, the plant resources, 
There is an amazing symphony of life all around us. And we have lost our ability to appreciate it. And so the crisis that we face has as much to do with pipelines as it does to do with John's death, as it does to do with our own sense of loneliness that has been taking us over. And I'm not suggesting that we all go out and try to save the next John. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we need to understand what the problem is if we are going to truly find the solution. Like many of you, I work on all sorts of things. Renewable energy, getting, you know, today I spent a lot of time talking about modernization of the grid. All of these things are important. But they won't make a difference if we do not begin to recognize the deep connections between us. If we do not recognize that we need every single life form in order to survive. And so I share with you two pieces of wisdom. The first is from Lilla Watson, an indigenous Gangula woman from Australia, who says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. My challenge to you today is to work together, not just with each other, but with the amazing gifts that nature provides us. If we don't do that work together, then we will perish alone. And the second piece I offer is a song out of my own tradition, which I've amended a little bit to make it a little bit more <laughs> accessible. And it says, I need you, you need me, we're all a part of one body. Stand with me, agree with me. We're all a part of one body. It is God's will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. We need each other. And I hope during this time together, you will think about how we reweave the connections one to another and also to the abundance of life around us. Thank you.